if I'm honest, I'm at a bit of a loss right now. Part of it is my voice because I was worshiping like I was losing my mind over there. But I wanted to make sure we capture what just took place. I don't want this to be a moment that happens and we pass right through it. Three words that I just want to take. First word that we repeated over and over again was holy. And this word holy means whole, perfected. And when we think of God and his holiness, it means that everything we could possibly want or need, everything that is necessary for us to be the full and complete version he envisioned when he breathed life into us is in him. So when we lift up the word holy, we are accepting the completeness of the glory of God that is here in this place. And why we should celebrate that is because you are in the presence of his glory and his holiness. Which means being in the presence of his holiness and his glory means that this is a moment of transformation. That this is a moment where, and I'm trying to move past this, some came in incomplete. You walked in heavy and incomplete. You felt, God help me, you felt the weight of the empty space, of the missing space on the inside of you as you came into this place. And you shouted. And you praised. But that weight is still there. And the glory of being able to ascribe the holiness of God to an encounter is for, for that person or persons. Congratulations. That space is now full. And it is now full with the holiness of the God who made you. It's now full with an understanding of who you are, completed and whole according to him and his presence. So when we say holy, we're not just talking about, uh, we're describing more than in an environment, we are describing a moment of completion. Second word, this is not even in my notes. I have no idea how we got here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That's exactly how we got here. Hallelujah. Praise. It's silent right now, but about 20 seconds ago, 30 seconds ago, there was a deafening praise that was happening in this place. And when you take the holiness, the understanding of his holiness and his glory, and you marry it with praise, we are bridging the gap between heaven and earth. So here we are on Resurrection Sunday, and we're not only filling in holes on the inside of us, I feel this so strong, but now we are bridging gaps between dimensions. And this is amazing because you got to be a part of it. And this environment that was created is one that you can create on your own, in your space, in your time. I believe God revealed that to us, not for it to just be a moment we have now, but as an open-eyed encounter. You could take this home with you. Last word, anyhow. There's an anyhow spirit in this place. Because anyhow means there is a glory that I see, there is a holiness I know, and there's an environment my life currently does not match. The holiness and the glory. And the anyhow is what says what I see cannot stop what he has done. Amen. What I'm looking at what I observe cannot stop what has already been finished. 
So I need everyone in this place to keep that anyhow. You're going to need it. And I mean that in the most amazing, positive way possible because it's not the praise that we uh, will lose and it's not just the idea of his holiness and it's not just the understanding of the Chabad, the weight of his glory in the praise. It's the anyhow that the enemy wants from you. So we're going to wrestle that anyhow and make it a part of who we are. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you'll give me a second, I will read the word. And then everyone, heel inches three, four, and up. (laughs) You're all invited to sit down. If you have flats, you don't care. You can stand all day long, but I'm not looking out for you yet. My high-heeled nation, I'm looking out for y'all. You have a champion right here. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Holy Spirit. Today we're going to start in uh, John chapter 12, verses 24 through 25. This is the message Uh, version that we will read and then we will sit. It says, listen carefully, this is Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you will have it forever real and eternal. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you have allowed us to gather today to honor and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, for even more insight and understanding of our role in the resurrection, that today be a day where we encounter your word in a fresh new way, a way that not only changes our minds, but that changes our lives. We thank you also, Father, that you've allowed this moment for us to gather, to do it together as an assembly and as a family. Lord, use me however you need to. Bring me dry so that those who need it may have it and have it more abundantly. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. I have 965 points. Not nearly enough time, but I will take the time to do this. Can we celebrate and honor our lead pastors, those who have allowed for us to gather and have an understanding of the gospel that is the good news? Pastor Terry Roberts, Sarah Jakes Roberts, Family PT First, we love you. Now, I love that clap. That was nice. That was cool. That gave me Tuesday night vibes. But I need a celebration of the shepherds of this house that is commemorative of Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to honor them knowing there. That sounds like a resurrection power. I felt that one. And I pray y'all felt that one as well. Also very quickly want to honor our worship and dance squad. Yo. Oh my goodness. Y'all tried to make me lose my voice. I held on. I got a little bit left. And I also want to take the, the opportunity to honor our pastoral staff. Pastor Brenda. Pastor Steph. Pastor Charles, my twin. Ah, thank you. I have to do that because uh, the understanding of how important 
all of the different components of this house is ties into what I'm going to be able to wrangle down and bring for you today. Um, the title for today's message is The Disruption is Real. And the reason I wanted to make sure I honored all of the different areas that I did, and there are many, many more. Hey, can you guys do me one more favor? I don't get the chance to do this often, but you guys are facing this way, right? So y'all see me, you see them, you see them, you see the screen. There's a production team that's behind you. So if we could just give them some love. What up, squad? Because we don't get to see them because we're facing forward, but I promise you, we couldn't have the experience that we have that not only reaches here, but reaches out globally without their tireless, tireless effort. Thank y'all so, so much. Y'all make me sound good. You like me. You make me look good. I appreciate it. We are all appreciative. So I honor all of the different parts of this house because all of the different components of this house set the stage for me to be able to withstand the disruption that is God being a part of my life. Let me unpack that because that sounded heavy. When God entered into my life, he wrecked everything. Turned everything, see, y'all feeling me. Turned everything all the way upside down. God started putting lines through my calendar. I had to start canceling things that used to be there. Standing appointments had to be no appointments. Relationships had to be no relationships. Habits had to be no habits. Then the no habits had to be replaced with new habits. All of these things took place because God encountered me and when God encountered me, my life changed. And the reason I honor all the different components of this house is because as that change was taking place, this was a safe space for me to be able to endure in what was happening. I could come here and get understanding. I could come here and get a, a, a word. I could come here and be edified. And most importantly, I could come here and be safe. It's hard to go through the wrecking ball that is God entering into your life and doing it in a space that's not safe. But this, that I call my home, has been a safe space, and it is in large part because of the people that I have mentioned, the ministries that I've mentioned. So why did I title this message, The Disruption is Real? Because, and this is the long story short of it, because I see that clock ticking, and I, I got 975 points. See how that number went up? <laughs> but we're gonna get the ones that the Holy Spirit says are necessary out. And so when I come to that understanding that once God encounters you, there has to be disruption. Uh, and then I think about what took place that we are here to honor, which is Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. Which is the, yeah, yeah, hold on. Our Lord and Savior took death, defeated it, and then walked out took captivity captive, and then as he rose, we all rose with him. So that is absolutely a reason to celebrate and shout. Because that's what it was like for me. Here's the one thing that I wanna leave with everybody, and that's why I said the disruption is real, because it sounds cute and it's very poetic. I, I met the Lord, and when I met the Lord, my life changed. This is how everybody sounds when they talk to somebody, when they've just been saved, talking to somebody who's just, well, what happened? Can you describe what, I met the Lord and my whole life changed. And you can hear the birds chirping in their voice. <laughs> you see the sunshine and the skies, the, there were clouds and then all of a sudden the clouds just cleared away. There was thunder and then the thunder disappeared. There was rain, the rain went back in the clouds. And everything was just beautiful because I met God. God encountered me and my life just changed. And the hard part about that is when you hear it that way and it's told that way enough times, when it's time for us to have our own encounter, we discover it's a little bit different. There are a few more details that, that go into an encounter with God. There's a lot more to it than just, I met him and my life changed. 
And so as we look at Resurrection Sunday, I can't think of a more pivotal moment and event, a more life-changing, life-altering event than the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. And so I see this passage which is talking about wheat and grain, and I, number one, am a very visual person. Raise your hand if you're a visual person. Yay! (laughs) If you are not a visual person, guess what? For the next minute and 20 seconds, you are now. When I read my Bible, I see it very literally. So when I'm in John 12, 24 through 25, and it says, it talks about a grain of wheat and how it has to be buried in the ground. Let's be very clear. This is Jesus speaking of himself. A grain of wheat is buried in the ground. It is dead to the world. And it is never more than a grain of wheat. And I'm reading verses 24 through 25 again. But if it is buried, it sprouts, it reproduces itself many times over. And in my head, I see it. And I said, you know what? If I'm going to teach about it, I think we should all see it too. So there is a clip that we're going to play behind me. It's about a minute and eight seconds. I'm giving you the time because I know our generation. 14 seconds and we're out. (laughs) Hang on. It's about a minute and six seconds. And I promise when you get to the end, it's worth it. Let's take a look at this clip. That is wheat. Doesn't seem all that exciting until still wheat. It's still wheat. Look at y'all hanging on past 20 seconds. Amazing. God is good. That is still wheat. This is my favorite part. This is what wheat looks like when it is buried in the ground. Look at what happens to that seed. Look at what's happening to the ground as the seed is growing. We're gonna pause right there. Can you, can my amazing production squad do me a favor? Yes! Can we go to the, the first screenshot of just the seed by itself? There it is. This is the wheat that Jesus is speaking of. That. One of those is wheat. I want everybody to take out their phones, take a picture of it. Go ahead. It's okay. You can use your phone in church. This is like a one time you can do it. You might as well just get it out your system. It's okay. Why don't you take a picture of it? Am I in the shot? Do I need the duck? <laughs> These things I just got to check. Okay. Now, for those of you who label your pictures, I want you, for the purpose of this conversation today, I want you to label that picture peace. Because if you look at that seed, it looks peaceful. It's still. In fact, when I found the clip, it had some really chill, peaceful, like piano playing behind it. It just, I was like, wow, I feel so relaxed watching this seed just sit there and be a seed. Right now, it's at rest. It is peaceful. It is still. Its environment is still. There's nothing happening around it. It seems so calm. It's so not disrupted. This seed is the same form that Jesus is speaking of himself as, and he speaks of it in this regard. In this form is how Jesus encountered his disciples and the earth. The disciples came to know Jesus in a certain way. They had a certain level of understanding of who Jesus was because he was with them and they walked with him and they came to see uh, uh, supernatural wonders and things of that nature. They came to understand Jesus in one way and if it were up to the disciples, he would stay this. This is peaceful, this is quiet. This is what we wish for when we encounter God. We want God to make our life look as still and peaceful as this. Except there are a couple things that we need to note about this seed. Yes, it's still. Yes, it's peaceful. It is also unproductive. That seed has a purpose. 
purpose of that seed is to feed people. In this current state, peaceful, quiet, unbothered, undisrupted as it is, it is feeding no one. People are still hungry while this thing is at peace. Purpose is not taking place while this thing is at peace. Destiny is not, being, is not happening. Kingdom not being advanced forward while this stays in this form. As peaceful as it looks. I want to go to the second picture. This is where we're supposed to be. This it was, is what Jesus was looking towards in terms of what was going to happen to him. He knew he was going to be placed in the ground. He also knew that he could no longer remain in the same form as the disciples knew him as. He could no longer remain in the same form as the world knew him as because he was put on this world with a purpose. And his purpose, as it says in John 12, was to die and live and multiply. This is not as peaceful. If I were to run the video, the first thing you would notice is that the seed is absolutely disturbed. The seed has to be disrupted in order for growth to take place. It cannot remain in its former form in order for it to do that which God has set aside for it to do. So number one, it is buried. And once it is buried, that is when it is time for change to happen. That's when the disruption takes place. If you're watching this as it's happening, and you, I don't know if you can remember from the video, the, one thing that, the two things that take place, one, the seed is disturbed. The seed is disrupted, and then as the seed grows, the soil becomes disrupted. It starts to shift around and move, and it has to make room for the growth that is taking place. Things have to be moved to the left. Things have to be moved to the right. There has to be a displacement for the growth that God said needs to take place, which was God's plan the whole time. When we encounter God and God shakes things up in our lives because he's putting us in the ground that we may grow, it gets very uncomfortable. And we start to ask for what we believe is peace. We want to go back to the stillness of that seed. Because the seed is unbothered. You ever catch people in your life and they are completely unbothered? All the time? And we start to wish, yo, I wanna be unbothered like you. Here's the thing with being disrupted. Disruption is what allots for growth. And if that seed is not disrupted, and if that disruption doesn't first happen to the seed, and then when the seed is disrupted, the soil is disrupted, and from the, the disruption of the soil, we have harvest. Family, the disruption is real. It's also necessary, because until God disrupts your life, you will not have the harvest that he has assigned over you. So as much as I would want to chill like a seed and just sit on the ground and let the wind pass over me, something has to grow out of me. Something has to break out of me. And then that thing has to disturb my environment. It has to disturb where I live. It has to disturb where I've been placed. And it has to start moving things aside. It's got to start moving some friends aside. It's got to start moving some relationships aside. It's got to move my expectation of who I think I am to the side to make room for the growth of God's expectation of who he called for me to be to spring up. Things have to be disrupted 
That's why I love Jesus for picking this particular image to give us an understanding of what resurrection power does to our lives. Here we are, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And I wanted, I desperately wanted to give the jump shout message about how we are saved, we are sanctified, and we're about to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and now we have the power of Jesus, and we have risen, and we're out the cave, and we're going to go into the world, and everything's going to be all right. I wanted to give you that message complete with the flex and everything. Except God said, they need more. Because as much as I want you to jump and shout today with an understanding of resurrection power on Resurrection Sunday, I need us to know that it was never about one day. Everything we took from today, everything we honor about today is what we are supposed to live from daily. I used to do this thing uh, not too long ago, I might bring it back tomorrow. We'll see how I feel about it. Because y- your timeline is real funny around Easter. Because it's like everybody has Good Friday posts. Everybody has Resurrection Sunday posts. You got the Easter fit. You got the Easter activity. Easter brunch. What you ate. What the menu looked like. You got the cool shot of the food where you blurred out the background. <laughs> and then the shot of you and your friend. That's what Easter looks like on a timeline. You know what Monday looks like? Monday. (laughs) Monday look like Monday. We just got fresh revelation of Jesus dying for our sins, coming out of a cave, defeating death, and the next day we act like it didn't happen. And the reason I believe this happens is because when we walk in the fullness and understanding of resurrection power, it has to shift and change things. It has to shake things up. It disrupts your life and disruption is not comfortable. But the life that we had before we had the understanding of Jesus is. So we go back to that. We go back to the seed. The unprofitable unharvested, not aligned seed. That's Monday. That used to be Monday. That's not going to be Monday anymore. But I'm not going to sit here, stand here, and act as if this is not difficult because disruption is hard. It is hard to accept that everything has to change once I have an understanding of who Jesus is. I don't have enough time to even tell you how disrupted my life is just from saying I know Jesus. Because it changed everything. It changed how I spent my time. Saturday morning used to be sleep. Sleep was so beautiful, it was peaceful. I slept like that seed. Just laid there, nothing coming, and nothing's growing out of me. No multiplication, no harvest, but I was at peace. Now Saturday is a part of my preparation for today. Today is a part of my preparation for tomorrow. I did not prepare like I had to prepare before I decided that Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. And on top of that, accepted the assignment to walk as a pastor. So now I'm accepting that resurrection power has to shift my life. And once I accept that resurrection power has to shift and change my life, and I am accepting that disruption is now my new normal, God is going to continue to shake things up. Now I also have to accept the assignment that comes with that. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we're going to come back to it. Because at the end of the day, that seed had an assignment. At the end of the day, we all have an assignment. But what allows us to fulfill the the, the, the mission of that assignment is a full understanding of what resurrection power is and that it is bigger than one day. 
And it's okay if you have an encounter with God and God shakes your whole life up and it's uncomfortable and life don't make no sense. I'm talking to two people right now. That's all right. Those are the two people I came to talk to. It is okay to have an encounter with God and then look at your life and have it make no sense whatsoever. Which is what happened to these disciples and those who walked with God. Jesus encountered them and turned their lives upside down. They all had to change jobs. All of them had to fire themselves. They didn't get fired. They had to choose. They didn't get laid off. They had to choose. And they didn't just get bumped up in the queue in terms of where they were. They had to choose. This was a whole different line of assignment for each and every one of them, and they had to choose. And once they chose, their entire lives shifted and changed. No more going to the same place I go to to get fish. I can't go back there anymore. That's not my job. No more going to the same table, Matthew, to collect taxes from your own people. He, I love that, 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 that vision of Matthew because Jesus walked by him and he just said, come with me. And Matthew leaves. And he leaves everything on the table. <laughs> If you're going to allow yourself to be disrupted, you need to leave everything on the table. I'm talking to somebody right now. <laughs> Knowing that you will not understand how all this works, that disruption is about to be a part of your whole life. Everything is going to change, and the only time it makes sense is when Jesus is talking to you. Keep that one right there. Don't miss that. In disruption, the only time the life that you are living in, the life that you are now accepting when you say resurrection power is mine, that life only makes sense when Jesus is speaking. That life only makes sense when God is talking to you. That life only makes sense when you're in your word. That is the only time where all of the disruption makes sense. Here's what I didn't say. The disruption does not stop. It's not about making the disruption go away. This is what I wanted to say for you. We wish for the disruption to go away because it's so uncomfortable. I say Jesus is Lord and Savior. Now I'm in my word and I'm speaking the word and I'm walking around and I'm listening to different music and it's very uncomfortable because the homies who used to listen to the music I used to listen to are still listening to that music. I'm listening to different music, but we in the same car. Y'all know this. Some of y'all gonna be in that same car today on the way home. <laughs> it's okay, you're gonna be fine. It's gonna be uncomfortable, but you're gonna be fine. If I could boil this whole word down to that alone, you're gonna be uncomfortable, but it's gonna be fine. As long as you continue to stretch and grow that which needs to be displaced will be displaced. And you will find yourself in a different car with somebody who listens to the music that you listen to now. And who knows, you might even be the driver, amen? Makes it a lot easier to, to dictate what you're listening to when you, you're the one. When you're in the passenger seat, a little tough to petition for yourself, huh? If you're in the backseat, it's real hard because they don't hear you because they're playing the music that you don't want to be listening to. <laughs> Things will be displaced. It will be uncomfortable. It will continue to be uncomfortable, but it is okay. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. Disruption has no choice 
but to be uncomfortable. It is the nature of the word itself to disrupt. And so in order for us to really walk in the fullness of an understanding of what resurrection power means in our lives, it means once we leave today, we now look at our lives and we say, does our life line up with what I just heard? Does, our, does my life line up with what I just read? Yes or no? And it would be very easy to just decide to go back to the old way of doing things because that looks like peace. Pastor Steph put it great on, on Good Friday. She talked about how um, we get saved, and some of us are getting saved just because we have a candy notion of what Jesus will do for us. I think a part of that candy notion is a false sense of peace. Some of us think God is going to solve all of our problems just because we said yes and amen. Just because Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I now have no problems. That is nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> not a single version. There's not a person in the Bible who agreed to walk with God and did not have problems. There's not a single person who agreed to walk with God who did not have their life completely disrupted. But those who were the most successful at walking with God, those who were the most successful at understanding and laying hold of resurrection power were those who refused to go back to the peace that was that seed. No matter what it anyhow. They said harvest anyhow. Resurrection power means things have to be shaken all the way up. Ooh, I'm so out of time. Okay. 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 Me and you time. Me and you. We're going to do this. I want to give you three things. I won't have time to unpack all of them, but here are three things that I want for us to hold on to. Terms that I want us to keep in mind and keep in spirit because after today, once we decide to lay hold of resurrection power, we are now going to encounter the disruption that is real. And instead of running back to the comfort of an old thing, much like what the disciples wanted to do, if it were up to the disciples, Jesus would still be with them now. But if Jesus was still with them now, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be with us now. When the scripture in John 12 talks about multiply, multiplying after that seed died, Jesus was looking at the multiplication of what would take place when the Holy Spirit fell and every to everyone received the Holy Spirit and walked out who Jesus was on earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That is what Jesus was looking at. The disciples wanted to remain comfortable because Jesus was right there with them. Which means if they tried to heal somebody, it didn't work. They run home. Jesus! We tried to cast out a demon. It didn't work. This happened. They wanted Jesus. Jesus! Right next to them. Instead of the Holy Spirit inside of them. But in order for us to walk to get to that place where we walk from the, the, the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit and with Jesus too, because when he ascended, he now took his place at the right hand of the Father to intercede on our behalf, to have the full scope of resurrection power at work in our lives, we have to be disrupted. First thing, when Jesus came, the first, one of the things that he did that I loved because after he died and was resurrected, he did not just go straight to heaven. He stayed on earth because he had to walk around and make some rounds. I believe he did this because he understood the impact that he had had on the earth, on his disciples, and on creation. He said, wait a minute, this is messy. Let me put some things in place to help you deal with this disruption. First encounter I wanna highlight is he gives revelation. 
Now, Jesus has an encounter as the first person to see Jesus was Mary Magdalene. Now, there are multiple different accounts of what took place in terms of who came to the cave first. Some say it was a crew of women. Some highlight specifically Mary Magdalene. Uh, One specific account says it was Mary Magdalene. And what I love about her being the first person to see Jesus is nobody understood the resurrection cycle better than she did. Because Mary Magdalene's brother was Lazarus. A resurrection. So whereas there were other resurrections that took place according to Jesus, this specific one hits different from Mary Magdalene because it was her brother, which means she had to witness what the scope of resurrection looks like. Number one, something has to die. That was her brother. Number two, then you have to grieve. Number three, then he was brought back to life. And number four, their lives changed. This is the cycle of resurrection that we are called to live in. The way you used to live has to die. The way you're going to live now has to live. And now your lifestyle changes and everything that takes place is seen through a completely different lens. So to have Mary Magdalene be the first on the scene made a lot of sense. Because when she goes back to the disciples to, to let everybody know he's back, she is running back and excited. Our teacher is back, and they're like, why are you so excited? But it's because she has an understanding of what the scope of resurrection is. So she says, oh, no, I get this. Our lives are about to change because our teacher is back. And what he does when he comes back, uh, I want to skip very quickly to Luke 24, 44 through 45. We're going to speed through these. Jesus is now speaking to the disciples. This is after he has come back. He encounters them, a group of them. So it's Luke 24, verses 44 through 45. It says, then he said to them, these are the words which I speak to you, that I spoke to you while I was still with you. I'm going to pause very quickly. He told them what was going to happen. Let me be clear. God's going to tell you what's going to happen. God doesn't throw you into a new life without at least giving you a heads up because you need to choose. Jesus told the disciples everything that was going to happen. He said, listen, I'm going to be offered up to men. They're going to kill me. I'm going to come back in three days. Wait for me. I'm paraphrasing. And so then it all happened and the disciples start freaking out. And Jesus is like, why are you so upset? It's a great encounter when you read it. He encounters two disciples, and they're so gloomy. They're, deci- they're, they're, they're described as sad. And so they start telling him. They don't know they're talking to Jesus, and they're boohooing in their soup. Oh, my God, my Lord and Savior, he was here. Look at what they did to him. And then this happened, and he was supposed to be our, uh, he was supposed to restore our city, but he couldn't restore the city, and now he's dead, and they're boohooing. And Jesus is like, why? I'm right here why are you so sad? I told you all of this was going to happen. When God tells you something is going to happen, when it happens, rejoice. Even if it don't look sweet, even if it doesn't look fun, rejoice. I'm moving. Verse 44, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Here's the verse. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. First thing he leaves is revelation. Resurrection power means once I have an understanding of how God works, Once I have an understanding of the power of what took place, of Jesus dying for my sins, when I read scripture, it hits different. How I see scripture changes with my understanding of resurrection power in my life. That was why I love that he came back and spoke to the disciples and he said, now I need to unlock the scriptures to you. They didn't need the scriptures unlocked to them before because they were walking with the fulfillment of the scripture daily. But he says, I'm gone, so I've got to unlock this for you. And what I'm 
making sure we all keep in mind is that as you walk, every time you encounter scripture, what you see in the scriptures, the new understanding you develop as you read scripture, that is going to be the guide that allows you to withstand when the disruption takes place. Because in that scripture, you will receive a word. What you read gives you a heads up for what's coming. It doesn't mean there will be no disruption. It just means that as you are being disrupted, you will be in real peace. First thing he leaves is revelation. The second thing, this will probably be the last thing I get to, and then we are leaving. First was revelation. The second thing that Jesus does that I love so much is when you accept resurrection power, there's restoration. One of my favorite passages, one of my favorite encounters that I saw it so differently just recently, John 21, 15 through 17. Now Jesus has come back, he catches his disciples, (laughs) they're fishing. Peter doesn't know what to do with himself anymore. He decides to go back to fishing. Jesus catches up with them and it says in verse 15, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. That's one. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Third time, calls him by his government name, asks the same question. This means there's something here. Third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is known as Peter being restored to his office, to his proper uh, alignment and understanding and um, purpose as a disciple. I want to also look at restoration from a different perspective because I'm one of those people who ask, why does God repeat himself? So one of the reasons Peter needs to be restored is because as Jesus told him, he was going to deny, Jesus told Peter he was going to not deny him. Peter said, I won't, and then he did. Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times. So as I'm looking at this passage, Jesus keeps asking Simon, do you love me? And, and, and Simon says to Jesus, yes, I love you. He says it three times. So three times he denies Jesus. If we're really going to call this restoration, then there needs to be three times where there's an acknowledgement that I love Jesus. Three times he denied him. Three times he said, I love you. We're even. When you walk in uh, restoration, when resurrection power, restoration is always at your grip in terms of an encounter with God. You're always going to get the opportunity where at one point you denied him, you will now not only accept him, you get to tell him you love him. So this is the restoration that I'm looking at with Peter. Not only does he get his job back, but he gets to cancel out what he did. And he gets to do it from his own lips. The same lips that said, I'm denying you, I don't know you, I don't know you. Through those same lips, he says, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now we're square, let's get down to business. Resurrection power in its fullness means allowing for encounters where God is going to restore you, where you have denied him previously, you will have the opportunity if you fully understand and accept that he died for all, all, all of my sins. Every time that I missed the mark, every time that I denied who he was, every time that I used my life to deny who he is, every time that I used the way I talk to deny his impact on my life, Once I decide resurrection power is real, that when he came out of that cave and he rose, I rose with him. That means now I can accept my restoration as well. Leaving you with those two. Fam, the disruption is real. But 
What else is real is the power of the resurrection that we are observing today. You know what makes it real? That it goes beyond today. What makes it real is it's more than just Resurrection Sunday. It's resurrection, period. We give it a day because we've all gathered on this day. But after today, I still want the word resurrection to resonate in your spirit. Because now your life changes. The disruption becomes very real. And we're ready for it. And we can handle it. And we don't have to seek a false peace of being a seed when we can embrace the true peace of being the harvest of the one who was the seed that he may be multiplied through us. Let's stand. I want to make this as quick as I can. There are those in this place who want to begin a life with the one who went through it all for us. You're having an encounter or you've had an encounter with Jesus globally, I'm speaking to you too. If today is the day you wanna begin accepting not just disruption, but ultimately the harvest that must come from the disruption of your current life. If you wanna begin a journey with Jesus, Go ahead and put your hand up. And if you, yes, I see all of you in the back. That's what's up. I see you too. I see you too. I see you as well. Globally, you can put your hand up. We have people in the chat waiting to begin that journey with you. House, as a house, as a family. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the gift of resurrection power. I receive it. And when he was raised up, free and victorious, having carried all of my sin, all of my weaknesses, all of my shortcomings, carried them to the cross, nailed them to the cross, and raised up with me, free, victorious, and made new. Father, we love you. Thank you for the gift of your son. In Jesus' name, amen.